Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm really happy we have this opportunity to talk, debate in Bucharest this evening. My name is Claudio Pechun. I'm the spokesperson for DEMOS, which stands for uh, the Party of Democracy and Solidarity, Romania. And uh, we host uh, these days in Bucharest uh, representatives from parties left-wing parties and green parties from our region. Don't ask me where it starts and where it ends, because it, it can turn into a very heated debate. Um, but apart from the geographical uh, uh, dilemmas, uh, we do have many things in common. And this is actually the third meeting that we have. The first one was uh, in Warsaw. Uh, our friends from Razen, as usual, with uh, having the initiative, uh, invited us in uh, Warsaw to meet each other and think of ways to formulate our support for uh, the Ukrainian people and from, for our Ukrainian partners and colleagues. Uh, but also it's uh, about more than that. It's about uh, many things that we have in common. Uh, then we met in Prague, uh, and we thank the, the colleagues from Budapest for hosting us. And now in Budapest, <laughs> and probably Budapest at some point. <laughs> Our friends and colleagues from Sikra, uh, they are also very involved and uh, willing to, to, to move the conversation forward. Uh, well, I said some names. Uh, look behind us, we have also these beautiful flags uh, from all the organizations which are present. And uh, I have to say that this is uh, just like kind of the core group that uh, engage in the conversation, but we're in contact with other movements and parties uh, from Central Eastern Europe to kind of enlarge the circle, uh, see what we have uh, in common. Uh, I already started uh, presenting our guests. Uh, I will do it again uh, to know their names, uh, to remember their names, because probably you hear them a lot more. Uh, we have Yasmin Najima from Budush Nost, Czech Republic. Then uh, Victoria Fiku, Social Mirur, Ukraine. Uh, Lili Vanko, Sikra, Hungary. And then Zofia Malis and Maciej Konieczki from Razem Poland. Uh, I hope I, I spell everything right. Um, and for today we have uh, many things on our plate, actually. Uh, first, we want to map uh, our region in terms of politics, in terms of economy, and in terms of, uh, let's see, progressive green uh, movements and parties. Uh, and then, of course, we're open to, to hear your thoughts and uh, questions if you have any. So I'll, I'll just briefly start with a round of questions. Uh, we want to have this uh, debate in a kind of conversation mode. Um, we're going to start with, uh, of course, because we're left-wing, we start with the economy. The economy is important. Uh, then we're going to see what's the, the, the political uh, landscape, how it doesn't look. And then we'll turn to uh, uh, green, left, progressive movements and parties, success stories, maybe lessons learned, and some ideas to build something for the future. Uh, so I'll just, without uh, having a kind of a preset order, I'm going to move to Lily. And uh, yeah, yeah, sure. uh, yeah. How how how's the economy uh, and society in Hungary lately? Uh, you can have that. Mike. Sure, I, I recognize it's going to be my face that I sat next to you, that it's, I'm the easiest person to call out. And just as you were asking your question, actually, then I took some notes before this and I realized that the whole like economic and political situation in Hungary is very much intertwined, so I, I'm like, going to have some trouble separating them. But do you also want us to reflect on the current cost of living crisis and uh, the handling of it by our governments? Or I can give you a bit of a background, I think, because 
you probably read a lot about the Orban regime, and I think there are certain misconceptions as to what is the sustaining force of the regime. Often it's understood to be corruption, that's like an economic and political issue, I guess, at the same time. But I think maybe a, a something, yeah, I can highlight something that's maybe less discussed, and maybe it's of interest for you, because I think the only way you can understand the ascent of the regime and the hold they have on the economy and the whole political sphere is to look at like a sort of a bigger picture because the Orbán's ascent to power ultimately I think started with the regime change and like, Hungary was known as the poster boy of liberalizing the economy and like following all these democratic changes that were also needed for um, EU membership, right? But then actually that's a transition gone quite wrong uh, in a lot of senses. Uh, because there were a lot of like, losers of this transition and this massive movement of uh, deindustrialization and economic disarray that is maybe not talked about as much. And the democratic institutions that were placed, that were put in place, were not really, they were not really substantive. They were not really held up by a democratic consensus and people didn't really believe in them. They were not really society, societally accepted. So, and then also coming to uh, the financial crisis of 2008, it was very badly handled by the then like, social democratic government. And obviously countries in our region were hit really hard because they had just liberalized their markets. And that's when Fidesz swooped in, in this like, perfect storm, and sort of understood what is needed in that moment. And yeah, it's a big loss of the left not to have recognized it, not to have actually found a way to connect to the people, connect to actually small businesses in Hungary that were completely made destitute by the fact that all these multinational corporations were coming in. Uh, and Fidesz kind of realized that, hey, there's this huge gap. And then they seized this, and they had these civic circles, and they put forward loads of policies that would support small businesses in Hungary, and all these legislation against multinational corporations, and the IMF. So they had things that you could also argue for from, I guess, from a left-wing perspective that obviously there wasn't really their focus. So that's how they then seized power and then, as, and they won a landslide victory in 2010. And since then, is what I guess most people hear about, they completely restructured the whole political sphere and the whole economic sphere. And now I guess I should focus on the economic restructuring. Um, there's this overt focus of the regime to have a system of national cooperation, is how they call it. It's basically whoever is not with them will never ever succeed economically in this country. It's a bunch of smaller to medium businesses and certain oligarchs. Orban's childhood friend, who is I think an electrician by training, is one of the biggest employers in the country. He's in banks, he's in building corporations, or like lots of housing projects are constructed by he's in many, many, many companies. So a lot of people's economic well-being is actually tied to the system, and that's also what holds it in place. So and um, and also, yeah, it's a very much a workfare society. All the welfare elements have been stripped, and that's really much really, really, really reiterated everywhere. It's a workfare society. The way you join society is by you working, and yeah, and also lots of the labor laws have been shifted so as to serve largely for like automotive industry from core economies like Germany. So if I, I think yeah, everything has an economical underpinning. You know, if you look at all these changes of labor laws, if you look at changes of educational laws, for instance, they uh, now you only have to stay in school until you're 16. And the reason for that is that they want people to go into work in these factories that then produce value ultimately for German companies. And it's a very short-sighted goal because there is some capital accumulation for certain people. Actually, that's another misconception. I think that not many people profit from this regime. Well, quite a few people profit, but on a very short term. And I think it's not a very sustainable economic policy to be building on this because we know that these automotive industries are not going to be there forever. And the moment there's this whole electrification wave, Germany's going to remove all their factories from Hungary because all the high-tech research and development things are still in Germany. So, yeah, and in line with that, obviously, uh, also during COVID and now the current cost of living crisis, it's not the needs of, say, the working classes or it's upper middle class needs that are prioritized. So, People who have something, they will be supported. 
in these policies, Hungary had actually the worst uh, support systems in place during the pandemic. Uh, basically, no uh, support for lost income and all of that. So you can see that this is yeah, a very uh, unjust system. And but there's some people that profit from it, and that's also a reason why it's still in place. Sorry, it was a very uh, broad question. That's good. Let's do it over here. Uh, we'll move to Victoria. Um, nice to meet you here. I will uh, say a little context about the economic in Ukraine for, for now, uh, what is happening and uh, what is uh, expected near to be happening. And so I need to underline that Ukrainian economics uh, didn't pass uh, the way from Soviet um, model to uh, like, um, market and uh, uh, now we have this mix and uh, we have minuses from all of these models and uh, uh, yeah um, from um, a lot of uh, critical infrastructure and enterprises uh, they are for, for by state they controlled by the state uh, but um, uh, they have like a lack of resources and uh, it's a really big problem and uh, we can uh, see it on the um, example of uh, the military uh, structures uh, because uh, for the eight years of the war um, always the media the uh, our government they say that we need to have a lot of resources and the money for the military sector uh, but uh, um, we still have not enough uh, for this and uh, this is an example for all uh, the uh, sections of the industry of uh, medicine and everything so the lack of resources and uh, uh, we really need to, to, to have it and to, to produce more uh, and um, oh, of course uh, uh, we uh, have uh, uh, the import uh, more uh, than export in Ukraine and of course it's a uh, like, uh, situation for, for the, the last decades and uh, uh, it uh, um, um, moved us uh, to the situation of uh, the high debts. So, uh, and uh, we had a campaign um, uh, supported by uh, international um, partners and RASM uh, too, uh, about the uh, uh, cancellation of Ukrainian debt uh, when the war started, because um, the level is really high and uh, uh, our government for all the years that they tried to, to have uh, this uh, like financing from uh, the international organizations and everything, but uh, they um, used it uh, only for uh, the uh, like, uh, current uh, needs, but not for like uh, doing something with the industry and uh, other spheres, and it's a very big problem for us now. And of course, now we are in uh, the position and the situation of war, and it's uh, too um, hard uh, to the all the economic spheres to recover and to, to do something. And uh, it's more like a um, bad situation for all uh, the spheres except uh, uh, the agriculture and IT maybe um, and uh, I would say that um, with the uh, agri-sphere uh, we have a problem because the current uh, situation with uh, the European countries uh, that uh, they don't want to have the Ukrainian province from, from this and uh, um, the situation is uh, too hard for Ukraine because what are we going to do uh, with this? And uh, of course, uh, we need to um, to do some modernization of uh, our um, uh, this uh, industry and everything. And of 
course, to integrate to um, the trading areas uh, of uh, European Union, and uh, it's uh, like uh, two points that uh, uh, unites uh, be between the, uh, each other. So uh, I think that um, um, the main point is that uh, our government tried to have uh, the financing uh, in fact, um, f only from people, uh, not from the businesses, and uh, it's a problem for now, and uh, as a left-wing organization, we stand for uh, uh, taxes for the big businesses and everything, because um, only people and their resources, it's, it's a bad way <laughs> to recover our economy, and we will need to reboot Ukraine, and uh, especially economic, uh, after uh, the war. Uh, so uh, it's a lot of work to do, and. Uh, uh, for the um, left wings uh, to to fight for um, for this and for good results, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Indeed, I was following the uh, legislative initiatives, and it seemed to me, and not only to me, that a lot of burdens put on, on on the shoulders of of regular citizens, of regular employees and not uh, on those who are uh, having the, the, the wealth in the country. But maybe you, you can develop that point a bit uh, later on. Um, yes, Mina? Um, right, so in, in Czech Republic, Czechia, freshly uh, renowned, um, the economic situation, I think it's, it's somehow representative of quite a few neighbors. Um, in the way that, uh, and, and again, I, I, I join the, the comment on the fact that obviously the political and the economical are pretty interlinked, so it's perhaps difficult to uh, separate them somehow. Um, but there's been a, a real attack on rights that you know people thought that they just had, and their social rights and their labor rights. Um, in, in many forms throughout the last uh, decade, uh, which are continuing, if not uh, increasing, in, in the last few years. Um, in particular, labor rights, so the workers starting. And these attacks come from so many different angles that it's really difficult to even keep track sometimes. It's, you're trying to um, and turn off a fire here, and there's three on your back, and you know by the time that you get to there, it's like it's it's difficult, and especially as a left-wing organization, and the lack thereof <laughs> of left-wing organizations um, that are uh, as strong as the neoliberal uh, governments and parties in place, um, it makes it, it makes the, the entire situation pretty out of control. Oh. <laughs> So, an example being, for for example, I mean, since uh, 2021, um, uh, Czech Republic has um, uh, marginal progressive taxation, right? Which uh, uh, it's not not really working. Um, the the Salaries are reflective of Central and Eastern European countries, but the taxation system is not adapted and adjusted to that at all. And um, the and of course, who suffers from this are low incomes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the the fact that they introduced this sort of uh, marginalized progressive tax ta uh, tax situation is supposed to somehow uh, hide. Uh, this problem, but uh, the uh, taxation on uh, other forms of capital, uh, on properties, are ridiculously low for um, people who have a lot, <laughs> and incredibly high in comparison for low income uh, salaries and, and workers. So 
this is just one of the ways that the uh, people suffer every day uh, in, in regards of uh, their labor rights and social rights in, in Czech Republic. And especially, I think it's going to be mentioned at some point, the crazy inflation <laughs> that's uh, been ravaging literally uh, all the countries and you know from west to east but particularly countries that already have uh, some sort of uh, issues with the incomes uh, previously the people from uh, these backgrounds have, have suffered immensely of, of this uh, uh, inflation. Uh, and another example, just briefly, uh, and this is something that also you can see a trend throughout Europe in general, but the consequences are not the same in Central and Eastern Europe, which is, for example, the um, uh, increase of pensions, uh, in t not money wise, because <laughs> I mean, um, but uh, in Czech Republic now they want to increase the age of pension from, uh, currently it's 65 years old. And to get the full pension, you have to have worked 35 years. And now we're increasing it, well, they want to increase it to 68 years old and 40 years of work. Which is <laughs> so not only you have to work longer in terms of age, but you have to start working younger too, because, you know, otherwise what are you doing with your life? You know, <laughs> enjoying your youth, what could that be, right? Um, so, um, and, and this is just one of the main debates. And obviously, we see what's happening in France and uh, as a result of it. But and this is going to probably go into the political because of the skepticism and the distrust uh, and the disorganization of people amongst themselves. It's really hard to organize, even when there's such big attacks on social rights. So I, I have a, a million other examples, and, and you know, I'm not. I'm going to keep them from later on in the conversation. But uh, but yeah, this is the current situation right now. So yeah. Great. Thank you very much. So uh, we now uh, go to Poland, and maybe you could split the, the the landscape, the first the economic and then the political one, and then we'll uh, oh, move to the areas. Right. There's two of us, so maybe we'll manage. Uh, so first. I want to agree with the uh, uh, Hungarian colleague on the roots of our current populist uh, government. It was uh, we had the same kind of neoliberal transition uh, that uh, left a lot of people behind in uh, economic senses, but we also judged people. But it was said that if now it's capitalism, if you if you uh, if you lack resources, in your, it's your fault. If you don't have a job, it's your fault. If you earn too little, it's your fault. So it was not only uh, economical, but also, let's say, cultural division. And uh, a lot of things that's going on in Poland now uh, make sense because of that. So, uh, after a series of neoliberal governments, law and justice uh, got power promising some, uh, social, on some social promises, but also because kind of revolution of dignity. It was more, more kind of culture war. But it was the war against smaller towns against big towns. Uh, regular folk about, uh, against big city intellectuals. The kind of opposition you, you meet in a lot of countries. But the reason for law and justice to get in power was obviously the neoliberal uh, governments that, uh, that, uh, from before. So, and the thing is about law and justice as a populist power, it's not Trump-like populist power. We really uh, delivered something on uh, in, in terms of labor standards, uh, wages, and, uh, and social benefits. For example, they, they provided minimum wage, which for low-income people it changed a lot because uh, you could earn one euro an hour before, and after that it was four, five times more. So it was a huge change. Child benefit for every child. Uh, uh, 500 volt. It, it changed a lot for a lot of families. They sent their children for the first time for two to holidays. It was a game changer. So at the third, at the beginning of the uh, law and justice government, uh, they really uh, made Poland uh, on the one side a little bit more egalitarian. On the other side, uh, they provided for those who uh, who had less. But it was the beginning, and, but obviously they were also authoritarian, conservative, uh, against women rights, against LGBT rights, and uh, and, uh, 
what's probably the way uh, what you heard about the uh, Polish government. Uh, but and, and the thing is, they were lucky also because they governed on the on the time of uh, prosperity in Poland. So from 2015, when they got in power, living standards in Poland rose enormously. It's like people earn much, much more than before law and justice. It's not all very, it's a little of, uh, of their, their job, and most of it is just their luck and, and, and prosperity, uh, and the time of prosperity. So that's the case until last year, that people were, were uh, getting better. And it stopped because pandemia less, and now because of uh, rising prices and inflation, for the first time in decades, people in Poland uh, can buy less for their salary than a month before. It's a new thing because uh, for now just the this government delivered. So even if somebody didn't like crazy ideas from this conservative government, uh, could say, okay, we're kind of crazy, but still I'm, I, 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 I'm better off with them than with, with Dover guys, so I will vote on them or I, I will stay home and, and see where, where it goes. So this changed because of of the economic situation now, uh, because of uh, inflation mostly uh, and, and, and uh, rising living costs uh, uh, in Poland. And the other thing is, uh, they haven't had this kind of big uh, uh, things like child benefit or minimum wage since years ago. Uh, for example, that's another thing about them. They kind of no liberal in sense, but they are very good at delivering uh, money transfers and it's a good thing because previous government didn't do it but they do not, don't invest in public services uh, in welfare state so it's kind of privatization of public services we cannot repair uh, our healthcare system but here you've got a few hundred what you can go and maybe buy some of these uh, uh, things you need in a, in a private market uh, it's, it's about childcare, it's, it's, it's big in education because we, they don't like teachers because the teachers don't vote for them. Uh, they, uh, they basically are in war with teachers. Uh, the public education is worse and worse. So middle class is getting out of the public schools for, for private ones. And that's, that's a big thing. So that's a kind of uh, no liberal uh, law and justice way of doing things. We give you money and please go to the market and buy the stuff you need. Which is uh, in long term obviously disastrous because in long term uh, the, 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 the decommodification of healthcare education is the thing we want and is the thing that works for, for people basically in the, in the long term. So, uh, so that's the case. So, uh, uh, so we don't know what will happen in the next election, but the thing is that this reason, economical, social reason to vote for law and justice is now weaker than it was before, but still people remember no liberal uh, governments from before. So they are scared that the old times will come back, I will learn uh, less, uh, it's going to be much harder for me, because I remember how it was uh, before law and justice, so, so, so it's hard. And it's on political uh, dimension, it's a nightmare for left, because we, we've got this conservative force, authoritarian, which is considered to be social, and you've got this liberal side, which is anti-egalitarian, and not only uh, politicians, also voters. I vote because I'm better verbal than those stupid peasants, workers, that vote for law and justice, uh, they got bought by the government. So deliveries on social and, uh, uh, and public services and helping people is buying them, it's corrupting, it's understood by liberal forces and voters as corrupting people. So it's a bad thing because they voted for because of their financial interests. We're above that because we're clever, we're from big cities, probably we're well off, better off, so we can afford to, uh, to have this position. But the thing is that first one side is extremely anti-egalitarian in a way of, in a, and, and is understood to be our side, it's, it's the, the worst thing about it, uh, because we all fight to defend democracy against law and justice, understood as uh, in a very, uh, not very wide sense, let's say. Uh, and on the other side, where these are, where is law and justice, really awful authoritarian, uh, guys, ultra conservatives, but they represent, let's say, a working class and lower income people. And then uh, for the leftist force like Razem, it's, it's a nightmare situation, but we're trying to uh, to manage, and that's the second part, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, yeah. 
um, explaining what kind of uh, gifts the neoliberals uh, gave to us all. And it's not the first time, it's not, it will not be the last time they uh, bring from society and politics uh, this kind of uh, uh, gifts, let's say. Uh, so, Zofia? Oh, I, I can just add maybe a little bit to, 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 the, to the picture that Machin has, has painted. Uh, so basically what, what peace also does, uh, I think very successfully, is, um, is to distract, or at least until the pandemic and the cost of living crisis, they have been very good at plant, transplanting and trying to transplant culture, all sorts of cultural wars into Poland to, to basically distract from their failures in terms of providing uh, public services and, and this, uh, this will become their downfall, I think. Uh, ignoring the crisis in the, uh, in the healthcare, ignoring, uh, for example, the, the transport, what we call, call the tra com communication and transport exclusion of uh, quite a lot of people outside the bigger cities, uh, um, and their kind of lack of will, I guess, uh, and a little bit of a complacency uh, in tackling these issues. I mean, over the years, this is this is already some years of their of their governing. Second term, they they have grown into the business, uh, you know, kind of structures in Poland, and our prime minister is uh, an ex banker, and they they basically send people and employ people, not only into into some. Um, Publicly owned uh, or partly publicly owned companies, but also you know, have relations with more and more private businesses. So, so it's preventing them from tackling uh, some systematic reform in the country, really in a uh, in a in a way that would be decisive. Um, uh, for example, a housing crisis is also really increasing in Poland. It's not only the issue, but I, I spoke to some of your colleagues outside and before this meeting. And we were talking about this reprivatization scandals in Warsaw and Bucharest, where you know some uh, previous owners of some nice properties were suddenly uh, coming up, or papers that some lawyers were, were were taking and constructing some cases to take over these properties, and then evicting the, the that's one issue that definitely was a problem, particularly in Warsaw. And elites, in a sense, of the liberal elites from Donald Tusk's party, but also the, uh, to a lesser extent, but still, you know, like the, the Law and Justice Party has not really uh, changed this or, 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 or brought people to to, to responsibility. They didn't, you know, kind of tackle that or punish uh, the people that that uh, in, in politics, the municipal politics, and so on, uh, that that were involved in this procedure. Um, and uh, no particularly systematic laws that, that would, would handle the situation were introduced by them. Um, and so, so, so there's definitely quite a lot of clientelist, growing clientelist exchanges between the government and the business, uh, additionally to the huge kind of, uh, you know, solidarity between, uh, between the conservative government and the Catholic Church, uh, which, uh, you know, kind of is also the basis of quite a lot of their, their popularity, um, I don't know, for example, in the eastern and southern eastern parts of the, parts of the country. Um, but I think uh, to go back to the political dimension, um, it looks like uh, like they are running out of speed uh, in the sense of uh, uh, I don't know whether they can still do this trick. You know whether the the, the trick about the pony has kind of gone gone a little bit tired, uh, particularly after they they have I think also to use another phrase jumped the shark and banned abortion effectively, completely, uh, and brought millions of people uh, from small towns, mid-towns, uh, women, but also allies like truck drivers and taxi drivers of all genders uh, to protest, and since then their polls uh, have not really recovered uh, in the sense that it looks like, at least when you peruse the polls, uh, they will lose their, their, their majority and will have to, if they want to keep being in government, they will have to look for some, some coalition partner. Unfortunately, the partner that is recently emerging is, uh, is a kind of a yobik-like, you know, like a, uh, 
even right or right, extremely neoliberal, basically. Like, the, 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 like early Europeans and kind of a Tea Party Trump all mixed together. Uh, so, but we are there. Machi is our member of parliament, one of one of uh, six members of parliament, uh, and we formed uh, when we came into the coalition as Razem uh, in 2019 and into the Polish parliament. We hope to to be re-elected this year, so the elections are probably uh, uh, this autumn. And we will see what happens. I think Polish elections will be really exciting because as far as I thought half a year ago, three months ago, well, the government will probably lose and we will have the dilemma, you know, to join the liberal government or not. Uh, several scenarios were possible. Now with the with the with the rise of the of the right wing, perhaps it's temporary because they started going into TV programs and started saying really stupid things and and you know maybe they will fall back again uh, as they used to many times. But I think the the scenarios have opened up considerably and I don't know now what's going to happen. So it's very exciting. Good. Uh, thank you very much. So we do have a sense of familiarity with uh, with the Polish case. And we continue the conversation about the, the we, we stop at the Czech Republic for now, uh, to describe briefly the, the, the political system. You know, who are the big players? You had elections uh, earlier, and you know, we, with this discussion about the political system, we kind of set the stage uh, to talk uh, later on about progressive politics and where are your organization uh, standing. So. Uh, well, give us some good or bad news. Or... <laughs> <laughs> oh <God>. Just news. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, I think everyone on this panel is going to join um, Poland uh, in their sort of bashing of the neoliberal uh, sort of way of governance that, that, that's been the way in our countries uh, for the last... Uh, but they were our parents in many ways. Well, More ways than one. <laughs> Here you go. Um, but yeah, I mean, Czech Republic is incredibly neoliberal. I think it's it's even become more neoliberal than neoliberalism itself. It's very <laughs> at its core, and um, the 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 way the well, right now we had um, uh, a general run for election, and he got elected as an independent technically, but he was supported by this sort of neoliberal coalition that was in place. And, uh, and we just see the results where, you know, just continuing this sort of neoliberal, um, we have like privatizations of sort of public services, just once again, it's one punch at a time. Uh, one of the most recent examples is, when you just take it as a one-off example, it might not mean much, but when you put it in the bigger picture, you actually see the, the, the pattern, right? Where right now they are closing a third of the Czech Post branches, right? And someone may say, well, you know, whatever, right? But it, it's, it has many issues. The first one being that the Post is one of the first places of communication between the people and their state. Uh, it's where people get their pensions, it's where uh, people uh, receive, you know, like uh, the administration and administrative letter and they can file a complaint and there's an entire system going within the post and by shutting down uh, a third of these places within Prague, outside of Prague and, and once again there's this big uh, debate in the Czech Republic about, you know, Prague being this kind of like standalone nation within the nation as well, but um, um, you're officially shutting down, you're reducing the chances of people to sort of even interact with their state, right? And the second issue that it raises is that, once again, because the reason that it was given is that Czech Post was a profitable company, right? And it's how these public services are suddenly companies that need to be profitable, and if they are not profit profitable, we don't need them anymore, right? And it's instilling in the mentality, again, of, of the people that the only way to exist and be in the nation is to be productive, is to make profit, and if you are not doing that, you are not worthy of existing, right? And the, um, the other issue, for example, is all of a sudden there's readjustment, once again, of the state budgets, for example. Uh, one of the... Uh, 
recent debates again was the fact that money just started little by little being shifted in things that people realized were perhaps needed as much. We all of a sudden want to increase the military. Uh, we want to spend a hundred billion crowns uh, buying U.S. Uh, jet fighters, um, and that's five times the healthcare budget for the year, right? Just to put some figures in place and to, to show how ridiculous some of these sort of adjustments are within the, the budget and within these, uh, um, you know, scare that, for example, was, you know, the fear, like fear mongering that was born also from the Ukrainian situation. And all of a sudden, that's a good excuse, right? Let's put all of this money little by little to put it there. And, and the healthcare system itself is also being uh, uh, sort of split apart. There was this uh, uh, policy that was moved forward when they want to have a two-way healthcare system. There's the healthcare system, because it's, a, it's a public healthcare, and that's good, you know, you're, you can have your healthcare. But if you want to have access to the latest medicine and to the latest uh, machines, then it would have to be, you know, privatized. So, uh, in, uh, if we go with the system, it means that the, in a few years, the only way to get the latest medicine is to be private. And if you can't, well, then I'm sorry, <laughs> right? Uh, and this is complete madness, right? Uh, and, and, and yet, this is where we're moving. However, there is this glittering hope. Somehow, we've had. Uh, in the last year, one of the first strikes, big strikes in 12 years um, from uh, uh, car manufacturing uh, employers. Uh, it was a Korean car manufacturing company, I, I believe, and they just said enough. And it was one of the first times in, uh, in a long time in Czech Republic, and they were successful. Uh, and, and this is where you see, I think, neoliberal government played this game, right, where they push it, they push it, how far can we go? And now they're starting to bump into some of the limits. And I think there's unfortunately still a long way for them to go. And they're learning from these limits and sort of adjusting the route. And um, so, so I, I think we'll see. But uh, for now, yes, yeah, this is the situation, so. Good. So, thank you for the news. Uh, Victoria? One good news, at least, in all of this. Uh, okay, just news. <laughs> um, I would say that uh, now it's um, war, it's hard, it's complicated, and our government <laughs> try to do it more complicated for citizens and uh, uh, for living and I would say that mm, we uh, don't have the leftists in the uh, government, uh, the left parties. They even closed uh, all their parties with um, the name like social or something like that. So the parties are closed, uh, go away, <laughs> because uh, it's uh, uh, some related to Soviet uh, past. Uh, so yeah, uh, they try to um, to be like with people, but they are not. Uh, and, uh, we have lots of uh, anti-labor laws uh, that uh, uh, were pushed and uh, they, they, uh, they, they do it uh, during the war, uh, so we have uh, zero contracts, uh, the employers can fire you uh, because they, they can, uh, they um, can uh, pay uh, lower um, uh, salaries uh, while the people are working a lot. And uh, yeah, uh, this loss is uh, really anti-citizens uh, and uh, they try uh, not to um, 
to, to say about it in media or uh, anything like that and uh, the uh, demonstrations are prohibited during the martial law so we cannot <laughs> express our opinion for all uh, the country and to, to, to have like, our voice and of course uh, they try to like shade uh, um, what they are doing because uh, the latest situation with the constitutional court uh, they wanted to, uh, to do it that um, this court will like uh, by control of uh, the party which is the uh, main party in the government uh, but it's not okay for the European Union uh, these rules uh, because we need to look at the proportion of uh, the members of the constitutional court and um, this is uh, the moment that it's uh, the a point of rising Ukrainian uh, society that we need to like um, to push uh, our agenda to to make the rules from if we want to be in the European Union so we need to have some uh, not such a uh, I don't know after uh, <laughs> after uh, oh, help me with this yeah yeah <laughs> sorry uh, yes and um, of course, uh, our society, they uh, uh, are totally in democracy, they want to uh, have the independent media and are the spheres uh, to, to be like in democracy, uh, but the government don't. Uh, we have uh, such an um, unofficial um, structures, like maybe uh, you've heard about the office of the president of Ukraine. It's absolutely unofficial structure that uh, was created by, by Zelensky and his party. Uh, it, uh, you uh, will not found uh, this structure in the laws or some official documents. It's really unofficial, but it presented like, okay, <laughs> office of the president, we can uh, <laughs> such an official. Uh, so, uh, yeah, but uh, the people really want to, to, to be in the democracy to, to live in this uh, um, but um, they don't want to be in politics actually uh, it's controversial because uh, this point when uh, you can enter the politics is too hard because um, this stereotype that uh, politics is something Blade, black in the shade and uh, criminal maybe or something so it's um, like more fear uh, that people uh, are feeling when they are thinking about the politics and um, the um, Society Buch is uh, the political organization, but we are not a party. And to to be a party, it's uh, a hard work with uh, the documents, everything, and uh, with the pain. So you need to pay uh, to the state uh, to register the party, and uh, the prices are high. I, I was checking today that it's. Uh, uh, 7,000 uh, uh, euros only for a registration in your party. Uh, this um, way to, to do this, it's like uh, government said that we cannot check uh, the right and the fair, fair of the, uh, your election and everything, so, but we can check <laughs> your payment, so please pay. Uh, and yeah, people don't want to, to be this, and of course, um, we have the grassroots initiatives. Uh, they are uh, strong, they can uh, push some interests of people, but uh, we need to be in politics because in politics uh, they can uh, like destroy <laughs> some spheres, and uh, we need to, to be there and to control it too. Uh, so, um, our ambition to be a party, I think it's really on time, we, we need to, to be there, uh, but um, I think it will be such a complicated way to, uh, to, to, 
to finish <laughs> our one uh, way, but I think that uh, the international work that the Italian group uh, are doing now, and especially during the war, it's very impressive and uh, very important for uh, both for Ukrainian society, for our partners like trade unions, at least, and uh, feminist organizations and everything uh, similar. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we move to Hungary, what mm -hmm. is the political landscape. Of course, the kind of the topics are uh, kind of uh, overlapping, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, we're setting the stage for the next, uh, on the next part. So how, how is the mm -hmm. politics in, in, in Hungary? Yeah, unsurprisingly, I mean, I was a little bit struck by how many similarities there are. I mean, we kind of know this, but in Poland, I know that there's an insane amount of similarities between our regimes, so... Yeah, my solidarity goes out to you as well, and the, the same. You thing, have much more. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's always that we're the black sheep, uh, and the, actually the same postal closures are happening in Hungary, so that's great. And again, I probably take a bit of a longer look at this political restructuring or authoritarian state restructuring that has happened in Hungary that I think ultimately serves economic goals, but there's this huge insane political restructuring that enables it to stay in place. So Orban, or the Orban regime has been in power for 13 years. So the fourth successive Orban government currently in power, they got elected last year, it was like the most devastating thing. I was actually counting votes in a random little city and I, I think I'm still traumatized from the whole thing because no one fully expected them to have another two-thirds majority, but they did. And I mean, that's another thing I would like to talk about because then when they got in power in 2010, they rewrote the constitution uh, without having a referendum on it, which is usually the case, and on the premise that this was a communist legacy, so it had to be scrapped and had to be redone. And then they installed, I mean, it looks like it's a document, but the fact that it's not even a constitution, it's called the basic law of Hungary, and there's some things hidden in it that kind of foreshadow the changes that would be happening. As I mentioned, this work fair society, that your basis of belonging to society is based on you being a contributing worker and producing is in the constitution. Uh, recently they changed it to include that a family is made up of a man and a woman. Uh, lovely. Uh, well, I can talk about that a bit later. And then the crazier thing is that the electoral laws were completely changed because Fidesz in 2010 had two-thirds majority in the parliament so they could pass all sorts of reform without any meaningful opposition because essentially we could just pass anything. So when they won again in 2014, actually they only had 40% of the vote, I want to say, but still retained two-thirds of the seat in the parliament. And there's also a premium for the winning party, so everything's catered in a way that Fidesz will win, and there's no party that can ever stand a chance, only maybe if they are united, and that gets me a bit into the political landscape, uh, because there's always these rules that are making it harder for smaller parties to run. Uh, you need to form a common list, and the other parties that none of them really would belong to the left, I would opine, uh, have a really hard time agreeing on anything. Uh, last year, we had this candidate, United, so it was a united opposition effort. But all they agreed on is that they need to get Orban out, which is not exactly a positive vision, and I think that's a huge failing of the so-called left in Hungary, and then we can talk about what the actual left is doing in a bit. Uh, and they put this uh, mayor of a semi-large town in Hungary that was leading the coalition. He was the United Opposition's candidate for prime minister. And the guy is basically, what he, is his name, yeah, anyways, not even important, he's completely out of picture now, which also shows that he was the wrong candidate. The other candidate could have been the current mayor of Budapest, who has a quite wide support uh, in the country. Anyways, that's a bracket. But the, the whole program was that we need to get Orban out, and we basically can do the same that Fidesz is doing, but without the corruption. So I don't think that's exactly a promising platform for anyone to be running in. Yeah, and another thing maybe that was reiterated a lot, that the current regime is building all these uh, parallel structures for healthcare and for education. So basically, if you're a member of, I don't know, an upper middle class right family, you're going to send your kids to private school. You're going to be in private healthcare because there's not enough financing going into any of them. 
the teachers are currently on strike, they have been on strike and there's huge protest events, again it's a similar thing that they're very much against the government, their, their salaries are, it's really abomination and how much they are earning, uh, so these are the sectors that are vital for the functioning of society and they're completely neglected, my hot take is that it's also that they're eventually going to bump into hardships and this is where the system will fail, but that will take a long time. And maybe another thing that I can talk about very briefly is that there's, I think I would say that there's literally no social policies currently in Hungary. I can talk a little bit more about housing because it's the field I know best. I work in housing as my day job. Uh, and everything is catered towards supporting people that are already well off. It's supporting their base. So for instance, housing policies in Hungary are really linked to demographic policy is basically a way of making sure that enough Hungarian kids are born. So for any sort of subsidy that you can get from the government, you need to have children. And there's a premium on having three kids because then you get the full sum for constructing a new uh, flat or a new house uh, or renovating some in certain villages. But it's not only that, but it's linked to this like really, I mean, it's bizarre because why should housing subsidies not go to uh, people that can't have kids, elderly that whose kids have already moved out, or young couples who don't want to then swear uh, that ex in exchange for money they will breed three kids. Anyways, uh, and also all of these schemes require pre-financing. So only if you have savings are you then able to really take them. So they are completely exclusionary of uh, low-income people. So that's an example where you can see that yeah, like there is. And then that's another thing that they can always then refer back to, oh, well, we have social policies, we have all these measures that are put in place. So that's like the whole populist element of the government. They are doing that also with the current crisis. They had capped electricity and gas prices for the longest time. But that, for instance, didn't include uh, firewood users who are actually the lowest income uh, in Hungary. And now they have price caps, or not anymore on petrol, but on certain vital uh, like household products like flour and oil and sugar. But it's again window dressing because actually it's not addressing the problem at all. It's, it's pushing up prices across the whole sectors and we talked a lot about inflation and Hungary has the highest uh, uh, like food price inflation in the whole of the EU, it's about 40%. And then the government could, can pull this beautiful card and blame the whole thing on the European Union and on sanctions. So there's all these populist policies that then you can point at, oh, they were trying to do something, but actually it's Brussels' fault. And the last thing, I, the last point I want to make that again was said a lot is that uh, the government does this thing that they create a lot of cultural backlash against certain minorities mostly, uh, refugees or members of the LGBTQI community and that way they create a lot of focus on these issues that are obviously vital issues and da -da -da, but then it's blown out of proportion so as to hide uh, straight restructuring projects and these authoritarian moves. This is like, uh, yeah, and I don't know, like a, maybe a fun fact I can say that this like, the other thing that they're doing is they sort of um, deconstructing these links of solidarity between various spheres of society, that there's, if there's a teacher strike and a taxi driver strike, there's no link in between, even though these struggles could be united. And uh, it, to me, it always seems like they are doing like Gramsci and Laclau but backwards. And it's not that surprising because here's the fun fact, Orban wrote his master thesis on Gramsci, and so he knows what he's doing, he's just doing it in reverse. So that's a sad and maybe funny ending. <laughs> Thank you, it's not the ending. Uh, we, we still have uh, one more uh, leg of the first part of the discussion. But now that we have set the grounds for, uh, uh, for the next part, um, I was uh, wondering uh, if you could share with us a, a, a bit more about your own organizations. Mm -hmm. You know the, uh, the kind of the struggles that we have, uh, maybe some success stories, uh, because usually we tend to focus on the negative part, on what's wrong with politics and, and, and economy in the region, and of course we're right. Uh, but I mean the very fact that we exist and we exist, and uh, there are groups in society who fight, who who, who respond, uh, who take on the, the powerful of the day. Uh, it's 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 relevant. So uh, we might start from there to to see if 
you know, what are the kind of the, the responses that we have. And the, while, while you do that, uh, you talk about your own mm -hmm. initiatives and organizations, maybe you can also point to the possible ways we can uh, kind of help each other, inspire each other, and uh, uh, sort of uh, create a kind of regional perspective on both capitalism, democracy, and all the current problems that we and we have this kind of strange fam familiarity because when mm -hmm. we hear the, the stories from one country, it's like this sounds like ours. Mm -hmm. So I mean, there is certain a certain model or an anti-model in Central Eastern Europe, and uh, this is a way to reflect on how to actually combat mm -hmm. it. So uh, maybe I'll start from uh, mm -hmm. uh, from Machi. Okay. So uh, tell us about Razen a bit and. Okay. But first, I hack the, hack the system. I will just have a few sentences, please, uh, in response. Because uh, first, uh, I want to say that there are similarities, but there are also differences. I mean, in Poland, the system is not as corrupt in uh, in Hungary in terms of connection between politics and economy. We've got state companies that are obviously uh, tools of the ruling party, but it's not like a private sector is so much. Uh, interconnected with uh, with ruling party, and the thing is, that's the tricky part because if you say if Poland became less or more neoliberal in uh, last years, I said become less neoliberal in a way. In in on the political spectrum, neoliberalism is not, let's say, uh, common sense anymore because of law and justice, whatever they say. So it's it's a change for for kind of change for better. It makes space for us. To, uh, to come with our policies and we succeed, it's, it's, it's on topic now, maybe, because for example, housing, uh, as providing housing from the state, was considered to be not political at all in Poland. Mm -hmm. It was said, it's, is it important for us housing? Yes. What do you expect of state? Nothing. It's a private thing. I should get my own apartment. Mm -hmm. And it was unreasonable from us to put it as a political uh, topic and, and the thing we fight for. And it changed. Now it's in the center of political debate in Poland, and because of Russia. And it really, that is not like we we're, we're bragging with no reason. It's, we were stubborn, and it's it's an optimistic thing to say. Sometimes you create the political spectrum. You have some influence. All of our politicians just do what the poll says, and it's not even in terms of strict political pragmatism. It's not the wisest thing to do. Another thing is abortion laws in Poland. It changed dramatically the political, the Polish people's view on, on it. Now the majority of Polish people are for liberalization of abortion law, even to the state from before law and justice. They want to liberalize it, and that's a huge change. And another thing is because we have this ultra conservative government, here, but to be frank, uh, Poland is one of fastest laicizing secular. Secularizing, secularizing uh, countries in the world with some Northern African country ones. So it's, for example, for LGBTQ people, state is their enemy. But time, day to day uh, functioning is more about your family, society, neighbors, pop culture. And in all these ways, Poland now is much more liberalized, much more friendly than it was 10 or 20 years ago. And government can not do anything about it. It's for them. It's not unreasonable to scare people with LGBT. Uh, maybe by the way we will play the trans card now uh, because of uh, another uh, trend from from USA. But it's it's it, to be, it's not all bad. At the same, a very risk because of conflict with European Union and the huge risk of uh, Poland falling out of European Union in next term if they win. It's a huge risk. But we're over stuff. So now we're asking. So we founded our party in 2015 in the, in, when uh, no liberal civic platform was in power and it, it was on the way of new left parties in Europe, anti neoliberal parties like Podemos, like Syriza, uh, so, we, uh, so we've tried ourselves uh, and we were very surprised to succeed because uh, we've tried several times before and we didn't. Uh, so, uh, and it, we became, it was the time of presidential election with no choice for leftist people of any kind at all. So there was no candidate suitable for center-left, left, 
whatever, socialist, whatever. And everyone was like, and there were no new force in politics. So, uh, so after that, we said, okay, it's our moment. Here's we for, we're forming a new party. Uh, we got rid of this old, old school working class socialist folklore. We just uh, get with new aesthetics, but with a clear social uh, uh, pro-worker program. And we, was, we were a party of uh, precarious, basically. Uh, unstable working conditions uh, was a big thing at the time, uh, non regular job contracts. And suddenly, a few hundred young people who haven't had anyone to vote, who was uh, a lot of them for, for economic reasons because of unstable working conditions, has joined. And, with, uh, uh, and there were elections upcoming a few months later. We've managed to uh, register this all over the country, which is a huge thing, and, and, and it was an uh, extreme challenge, and we, we did it. And we got 3.5%, which was at this election. We, it was not enough to get into Parliament, but to get state financing and uh, have, uh, have our feet in the, in the door of the political system. And then suddenly everything changed, because civic platform lost elections, and law and justice got in power. Law and justice, which was considered pro-social and delivered at the beginning with, uh, with uh, the stuff I said. And it was anti-authoritarian, uh, ultra-conservative, forcing even harsher abortion law, uh, attacking LGBT community, so, and, and undermining the, let's say, uh, basis of the democratic, liberal democracy in Poland. So the vision was very different. Suddenly we are not on the side of people pro-social party fighting the liberalism. We were pro-democratic party, uh, feminist party, LGBT party, fighting against ultra-conservatives with no liberals on the one side. Mm -hmm. And it's a very different situation. And suddenly when we, for example, organize uh, a protest, a famous protest in defense of independence of Polish judiciary, which frankly we don't give a shit about, really. Uh, suddenly it's a big thing because media, media care. And a lot of people come because of it. And then it's abortion, we care about deeply. And we organized, started this huge protest. It, was, it became much bigger than us, but we started. We organized first black protest in Poland. And people come to us because of it. Not as, not, not, they don't have to share our values, egalitarian values, in terms of economy. And first, it puts them in a very different situation and very different dynamics in terms of building an organization. Because sometimes now our members, even as civil advisors, expect us to be something different than we really are. And they are suddenly surprised that we won't defend those uneducated poor workers who vote for peace against uh, them. Uh, so, it's, uh, so it became difficult. And Another thing that makes it ex it's extremely difficult for us until now, the political scene is divided between so-called pro-democratic forces, which are mostly neoliberal, uh, authoritarian forces on law and justice, and there's huge pressure on us to join together all the parties against law and justice. There's no institutional need for it, it in Poland, so there's a difference. It's in a city, to, if we join together, we pro we're more likely to lose. But there's this huge idea of all the uh, journalists and a lot of people who think that if it's the first one goal, it's overcoming uh, law and justice, we should join forces together. And, uh, and it's a huge pressure and a very costly one for us. And, and but that's, that's the case. But, so we run two of our elections after that, uh, very unsuccessful ones. Uh, we've, we've done a great campaign for European Parliament, really the best one I've, I've done. We've done a great job. And we got something over 1% of votes, which was devastating for us. And that's the truth we've been talking before. Hard work might not pay off, you need luck. Because just after the elections, when we do our best, best elections we've done ever, getting 1% of votes, it occurred that but we stay alive. That's the main thing in politics. You have to stay alive until you get lucky. That's, that's... <laughs> <laughs> so, so we stay alive. Uh, and, that, and, uh, and that's uh, a funny thing happened. Our arch enemies, post-communist left, 
was in uh, the same position as we were, not the best one. Uh, the new formed uh, uh, social liberal uh, Wiosna movement was not in the best shape either. And we had to join forces together uh, to survive once again, and we did it. And we got into parliament in a wider coalition, and we managed to move this coalition to the left, really. So we, we this all post communist apparatchik started even to life being a leftist for the first time in their lives. They, they, they find it very attractive, enjoyable to have some opinions or something. Um, so, so, so it worked. And we were, we were the only one with ideas and programs. So we shaped the program and ideas because they haven't had any. So uh, it was kind of easy. So, but uh, until you gather, because it's, it's very different the case then. So, uh, so, for example, we moved a lot of things in Poland to the left. I mean, uh, putting housing in the center of attention, putting uh, unstable uh, working conditions in the, in the center of attention, uh, connecting left with, this is our, probably our biggest success, uh, with uh, class struggle and workers' rights. Because it was the other way around. You know? uh, workers haven't had any reason to consider leftist politicians their representation. It changed. We had also our first big strike in the private industry one, and we've been there. And we were with every workers uh, fighting if they want us there, uh, and more and more time they want us, uh, helping them. That's hard work. That yeah, it's, actual hard it's not like we, we come when we're strike. We're okay. with the workers, and then when the uh, conflict appears, we're already there. Yes. So we've had big trust. And it's a huge thing, and, uh, and we did it. So, uh, first thing, you need to be alive until you get lucky. Uh, and the second thing, sometimes unexpected coalitions can work out for you. But now we have elections, and we don't know what's going to be after that. Uh, we fight for the left to have, uh, have an independent list as a left coalition, not to join force with the others. We hope uh, it's going to be like that. And after the election, everything can happen. Unfortunately, uh, the coalition between law and justice and extreme pro-market libertarian fascists at the same time, Confederacia, is the worst case scenario for Poland, but we'll see. Yeah. I still root for the democratic forces. As we all. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sofia? No, I'll go last. Okay. Um, so, well, I, I'm just going to say funny comments uh, after both your, both your comments uh, about the, the state and the sort of uh, private industry not, not being so linked in Poland and in mm -hmm. Hungary. And I was thinking, oh, yes, Czech Republic would probably join more Poland than this. And then I remembered that during the COVID, when all the shops had to close down apart from essentials, so we had supermarket and pharmacy open and flower shops. And I was wondering, walking around, like how is, you know, I was thinking of maybe, to, you know, bring some flowers to people who are ill and things like this, and then someone made me notice that the Prime Minister of the time owned the majority of flower shops across the country. <laughs> so, <laughs> that all of a sudden it was considered a very essential shop. Uh, flowers um, and, and, and once again I joined with so many uh, of the uh, common points uh, in our countries and then also so, some different ones although Poland is uh, secularizing itself pretty fast now Czech Republic has always been at the forefront of secularism it's an incredibly secular country which uh, dictates a lot also the, the, the way people um, sort of the way you have to approach people from a political and sort of moral perspective somehow, uh, and uh, the left sort of had, after, after the Velvet Revolution, something that, you know, as the years went by, it became this little, uh, you, you know, in Western movies you have this thing going in, in, in the wind, you know, uh, uh, across, the, across the desert, so that's what was happening to the left in Czech Republic, really, and the sort of movement that picked up on this was uh, the pirates, so it's uh, an actual party, <laughs> uh, disruptive, you know, but uh, it's, it's a very interesting phenomenon that uh, I think you don't really find so much in, in other um, European countries where it's really, you know, to get together in a party you generally have to share 
the same values, but the people that got together in the pirates just shared a vibe somehow. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so um, they were just not happy with the government and, and they didn't want anyone to tell them what to do, right? So it became this sort of uh, uh, gathering of uh, everyone from uh, anarchy case perhaps more anarcho-capitalist to like libertarian and it also siphoned a lot of what would be uh, pretty good candidates for leftist parties mm -hmm. right so so and, and it sort of came and it was very successful it's a bit less successful now but sort of 2015 in, in, in this decade it, it worked really well uh, starting from this principle don't tell us what to do and um, the variety of people within the, 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 the party is extraordinary mm -hmm. and uh, some of the MPs that they have elected are actually in, in leftists and <laughs> would, uh, would be great candidates but they say that they don't have a structure where they could do their leftist politics outside of the pirates, right? So, because the pirates had the money and it started, I think it was a, a bunch of guys that were doing IT and <laughs> so they sort of raised funds and so forth. And so there was a social democracy that was the major player of the left somehow and that's been sort of dissipating as well. The Greens had um, an internal rope fight on how far on the left or the right or center we go. And this is how Bluetooth was formed, really. Uh, 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 from technically founded in 2019, but you know, it takes time to do these things, so it was around <laughs> for a bit, just sorting things out, coming out of the shadow somehow. And it was really people who were disillusioned with the current. Mm -hmm parties, but really the lack of thereof, uh, of action from these parties, and, uh, and this is how the structure started really, the, the name is uh, Future of course, because that's where we're looking, very optimistic people, um, but the, the interesting question was, as, as we started our path, very small party, Czech Republic is a very small country too, um, the concentration of people is mostly in Prague, which also makes reaching the outside of the capital really difficult. Uh, smaller villages, small people, difficult connections because they did a great job at disrupting the public services, trans transportation <laughs> to get the, anywhere around. So um, uh, there was a, a first election uh, that was just a sort of like, let's get this warmed up. And then um, there was the question of a coalition, um, which is a question that many left uh, parties face at some point in their history, I think. Uh, and there was a, a huge debate on that because then it would have been a coalition of the existing social democracy, Greens, uh, and uh, us, Budutsnost. And uh, a part of the, you always have a sort of theoretical versus practical um, decision to make in these situations and it's always a difficult one you, you know there's people within the party that you, you know believe in the party and they want to do it you know only with the party there's people that are more pragmatic and they're like well isn't the most important thing to just be in a place where you can make change um, but the, the difficulty for us was also because a lot of the circle, the political circle in Prague is very small, everyone knows everyone. <laughs> so the creation of Budusnost was something that was extracted already from two existing parties somehow. Uh, and the question was, well, if you came out of it, why would you run again with those parties, right? And, and, and I think it's a legitimate question. Um, but again, the pragmatism took over because if they lost the elections without us, everyone would have blamed us. It's your fault, you took all the voters. Um, but uh, we tried it. Uh, unfortunately, it was pretty unsuccessful. 
uh, at, to our surprise, to be honest, because we we did a good campaign. Of course, when you look back at the campaign, there's things that could have been done differently, but uh, the, we didn't expect that low of a result. But also somehow it sort of you know sets a stone in the path, and you know it it, it frees you in, in some ways, and uh, you know gives you a responsibility in others. Uh, to, to keep moving forward and surviving and persisting uh, and keep existing. So now, really, we have um, a few years ahead of us, which uh, I think are crucial actually to, to the development of the party because um, you are in direct opposition with the current government system. You don't have to worry so much about elections, which are always draining. Uh, uh, energy-wise, money-wise, for, for every small party, elections are always such a huge thing to embark on and actually there was many debates on whether we should have gone uh, uh, for elections or not. Uh, but it's also something that we, we've gained uh, a lot of experience uh, from uh, and we can carry on this experience with us. But, uh, but yeah, I think the, the the future, the future is looking good. Uh, in the way that there's um, once again so many protests starting somehow. We recently uh, organized uh, an anti-abortion protest. It's always a bit anti-anti-abortion <laughs> um, because uh, uh, there's um, obviously sadly like. A lot of countries, these movements that are trying to sort of change the rules around that. So there's quite a few campaigns going on that we, we can concentrate our efforts on, and uh, we just keep going, right? Like that's that's the only thing you can do, really. So, um, so yeah. Thank you very much. So uh, you support Raji's uh, uh, suggestion that you just have to survive. <laughs> <laughs> if you're successful, it's good, right? Uh, but it's more important to survive. So, uh, Victoria, since you're uh, your turn with uh, Social Ruch. Okay, we survived. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it's a great news. Um, yeah, I uh, would start uh, from uh, the um, moment that Social Ruch was created in 2015. Um, after the revolution of dignity and uh, uh, it was a big uh, organization um, the union marxist union uh, and uh, uh, the, the traditional story uh, they argued and uh, divided uh, during the revolution um, a few years ago when i started to be a leftist I realized myself like a leftist. Um, I uh, um, joined uh, the other part so, of the union, you know, <laughs> the former drama. Yeah, yeah it's a drama uh, because I really didn't know about the Tiani book uh, and uh, uh, that part uh, they were so active in my university, so like a grassroots initiative, university life and everything. And only when I uh, joined Satya uh, I understood why it was so awful <laughs> with that people. Uh, and uh, yes, Satya Nehru survived uh, their revolution of dignity, uh, being an organization started to do real action, not waiting for a revolution. Um, other revolution, not uh, <laughs> that. And um, as far as I know uh, now about uh, uh, activists and activities uh, that Satya uh, did, uh, it was a proclaimed uh, program of uh, anti <laughs> anti anti-oligarchy and anti-corruption uh, because uh, oligarchy and corruption uh, you can describe uh, the problems in Ukraine like, towards uh, so uh, they started uh, lots of campaigns uh, demonstrations uh, because we stand for um, economic uh, democracy political de democracy and uh, social uh, democracy uh, and uh, 
they did lots of uh, demonstration to um, make um, workers' uh, voice louder in uh, our society. So it, it was important. Uh, of course, we stand for the values of feminism, for um, minority uh, rights and everything. Uh, of course, for ecology, for uh, urbanism and everything, and the last uh, demonstration before all the war and everything. It was uh, for uh, the, it's called um, March uh, for Kiev. Uh, it's because of uh, awful urbanism in Kiev during uh, the Klitschko being uh, had. Uh, so it, it was powerful and the uh, social ruch uh, um, called not only for the urbanism but for, for the rights for people rights in, uh, uh, related to all of this and it was powerful uh, I, I think and uh, we have all this experience and uh, the war changed everything so we are not uh, concentrated on educational but um, less uh, concentrated on the educational spheres uh, and uh, demonstrations and everything but uh, we do lots of work um, in uh, international uh, connections we try to uh, have an experience from our partners to uh, to find uh, these um, uh, solutions for us, some um, advices uh, to um, go through some crisis or difficult situation in uh, uh, being a bigger organization because during the war we started to, to uh, be wider uh, and uh, some of uh, our ideas, our thoughts uh, are related to people because government <laughs> Like uh, do a pressure for, for, for people and they need to find some um, uh, people who will support, who, who will uh, understand their needs and their problems. So uh, I think that uh, we uh, have lots of, of work to do and uh, I hope that uh, all the experience we have in such a tough times, it will help us to improve, uh, to, to be a like, bigger organization, to have some experience to, to go uh, in our ambition to, to, to be a party. Uh, we have lost, uh, for this, uh, we have different uh, amazing people with uh, um, lots of uh, expertise and uh, of course we have connections uh, with uh, friendly organizations like trade unions and feminist organizations and uh, it's important for us because uh, the other problem is that uh, trade union uh, in Ukraine um, it's uh, yeah, of course is a stereotype that uh, trade union is a Soviet <laughs> um, so, ideas or everything so we have uh, a few like a strong tra trade unions but um, for example for teachers uh, my mother is a teacher and uh, she really doesn't understand what is trade union what or uh, I know that I pay some money for, for this, but what is really for? And uh, it's not only her experience, it's a really uh, popular thing between the teachers all over the Ukraine. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think that we need these connections uh, inside the country and outside the country. So I hope it will be great. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just gonna actually. Some of the people are getting really upset at me if I don't say this. And I had this. Uh, oh, um, <laughs> and I had this uh, expression in my head, which was uh, shoot the message or not the message. But that's not absolutely not the <laughs> correct expression. But uh, a surprise good news because I talked about the elections result being terrible, but that was just about Prague. We did get a few people elected <laughs> in some uh, towns around the Czech Republic. So actually. Here you go. <laughs> you think that things are bad, but sometimes you have to surprise the public with the good news all of a sudden. 
Um, so yeah, actually, uh, just sorry to, to interrupt, but yeah, we did have a few people elected uh, in some towns, uh, and actually, I think that's really great because that's how you see that how politics are done in towns, where it's about the people, right? And it's people trusting other people and the message that they carry politically, uh, and uh, that's how you see that the left still has a place uh, in the country. Uh, when once you have a person speaking to another person and listening to them and understanding what the problem is, is trying to figure things out. The other person trusts you, and that's how you you get elected. And that's also how you see that the issue is that some so much of the time we concentrate on the big cities where the the game is completely different, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that's where the left keeps losing. Uh, uh, and uh, so yeah, I just wanted to to share this. Seven good years. <laughs> yeah. You should have said you got it on purpose, so then to give us some good news a bit delay. But actually, it segues into a lot of the things I will be Drum saying. So well played, we coordinated. Uh, and talk, talk, talking about because there's been all these like, interesting stories, and I will speak a little bit about Sikra and try to be cautious with it. Um, yeah, I see the logo up here, and for non-Hungarian speakers, which I don't assume anyone to be because it's an extremely hard language to learn, uh, Sikra means like spark or sparkles, this thing that you hold up. And I can say pretty unbiased that this is what it looked like when Sikra appeared on the political scene. I was still living abroad, and then I was really happy to see it was in 2019, uh, under a different name at the time that this movement started. It was called more or less free Budapest at the time. That was the year of the municipal or local elections. And I'm happy to say that Sikra has been very successful with elections so far in its like, relatively short history. Because in 2019, the Dead Movement endorsed three candidates for the municipal elections, and they all won. Uh, one of them is the mayor of Budapest, uh, and then two other candidates in two districts of Budapest. One of them is independent, and the one belongs to the joke party, so there's another linkage. But yeah, and then those were all candidates that ran on a platform of uh, sort of green and leftist values focused on housing and focused on rights to the city and the use of public spaces and sustainability. And then uh, based on that success of like seeing that, okay, there's actually still a place for these sort of policies that the movement started forming and uh, sort of gearing up also towards running later in electoral campaigns. But not only that, it's also just because of the system that I described to you earlier, it looks very, very bleak. And I think, yeah, then I will connect to Yasmin what she was saying, that you need to build a base, you need to start this like bottom off uh, sort of, yeah, first of all, especially for young people showing that there's an alternative, there's still a voice or there's still a movement where you can be thinking of progressive policies and then you'll have a chance and also it's like, yeah, the whole educational system has been burnt to the ground and Sikra has, does this amazing job at sort of mutual aid and knowledge sharing and workshops and a lot of people are involved in, in other civil society organizations, other movements, mostly for housing or environmental issues, and all this knowledge is then pulled into the movement, and maybe here's the time for me to make that, uh, declare that Sikra currently is not a party, it's still a movement, but it, it has this association, so it could run in uh, the parliament to the elections or endorse a candidate again, and again, election success story, that last year a candidate has won uh, for the electoral region of the 8th and 9th district in Budapest. So we have a member of parliament. And then you can have this uh, argument about how useful it is to have someone in the parliament that largely serves a window dressing role, because obviously anything that Fidesz then proposes will pass. But it's also, I mean, I'm not gonna lie about this, but it's also, it's to show that, hey, this is, you can stand on this platform and it will get you to parliament and people do want this, and if you have this, crazy organizing in those two districts where activists would be knocking on doors every day, talking to people exactly as you were saying, and that shows you that, okay, this is actually possible, it's feasible, it will be an extremely long run and a long fight, but it's the only chance that we stand. And it's also a huge increase of resources to have someone that is listened to, that's sitting in parliament, that's considered a political player, and even from, 
seemingly banal things that, okay, yeah, the parliamentarians have a higher salary than your average Hungarian, so that increases party resources and or like movement resources, and that you can have common office spaces. And this is something that's extremely important for a small movement. And maybe I can speak a little bit about the candidate because he was a trusted figure in those districts. He, he's been running this, Andrzej Szambor, his name, he's been running this leftist, fairly rare left portal for a long time. And he's very much involved in the housing movement, also because of his partner and other links to other organizations. So it's someone who's known in the district. People talk to him on the streets. They still do. So that's another thing that we focus on is how can you have people like that and also across the country, which is now a big question for SIGRA, because next year uh, municipal elections are coming up. And it's a question where do we have a base where we can actually have a candidate? How do you bring those ties? How do you prepare someone for such a thing? And maybe I can also, because I'm the last person to speak, <laughs> talk about a bit about the things that I saw appear across all of us, is that one other thing that Sikra does is also to amplify the voices of other actors in the political sphere. We have quite a few connections to trade unions, and maybe then we can learn from our colleagues at Razen and how you how you not only swoop in for the protest or the strike, but how you then build these long-lasting ties with trade unions, how can you show them that hey, with quite a few people who support your goals, we want this to be a political issue. And the same goes for housing. I think a lot of us mentioned housing, and it's pretty similar in Hungary that housing is not recognized as a political issue. And I think we have a lot to learn from you in how you led that fight and how did housing that become became something that is talked about which it should be, I agree. So um, that's another thing where we can make up and learn from each other and all these electoral policies, I guess, and like, yeah, what are your strategies for elections and how you can learn from it even if you don't win? And maybe we can also share a bit about how this like grassroots organizing and actually building ties in the district led to victory. It's extremely resource intensive, obviously. It's people's time that you're investing into it. But then it gives you this and then maybe I can end on this positive note that, you know, like, my whole adult life basically has been in this, like, very current political system, and to have a set of comrades, you know, where you know that this is a community where we can teach each other things, where we can collaborate, uh, and you know that, okay, this can get you into parliament, people tend to agree with the things that we're saying. The sense of community is what needs to sort of lead you on the darker days, I think. And yeah, maybe it's cheesy, but it's a long fight for it, and at least we have each other in <laughs> that. Thank you, very positive note. And uh, before uh, going to you for questions, uh, Sophia, um, any thoughts on, uh, because we didn't really tap into it, maybe some thoughts on how we can work together. And I have to say that uh, you know, the progress meeting is not, it's not just meeting is also about working and uh, we're working on a set of values and principles that in principle we, sh we have we share we have in common and we'll see where that leads yeah okay so so we are attempting at uh, slightly formalizing our uh, discussion group and sharing experiences and uh, maybe building uh, a platform for political leftist uh, green uh, organizations and parties in the region, which we broadly call uh, Central Eastern uh, Europe. And uh, the reasons uh, why we would want to join forces, uh, I think this debate was all about it. We have quite a lot uh, to do. Uh, it's uh, Our region has quite a lot of challenges. We are not uh, Sweden or Germany, there are quite a lot of social social issues and political issues that uh, need to be fixed, and we are all uh, very engaged people that, uh, uh, that 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 see these 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 challenges and also the commonalities. Um, uh, and I think this, this this point that you have to be in luck and and, and survive is is important, of course, but it also means that we are quite good at surviving, and this is something that might be different from, let's say, uh, Western left parties, which are very established. All those Western left parties, let's take, uh, I don't know, randomly, that's purely random selection, 
uh, the link uh, investor party in mm -hmm. Sweden or Labour are uh, in the UK are really really long standing, sometimes hundred years old, mm -hmm. you know, uh, with 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 lots of structures, lots of money, uh, and it's kind of what what you might consider is their strength is a little bit to me their weakness as well. They have the structure, the structure, and the, the kind kind of establishment, the left establishment. Uh, aspect that makes them cook a little bit in their own sauce, you know, they organize quite a lot of debates, they also invite us, we have to say that there was, you know, like over the years, mm. since uh, Demos and Razant, I hear since the group were formed in 2015, and from all sorts of conversations that I've had, there were a lot of contacts with foundations like Rosa Lux or, you know, like on the radical left, and uh, and lots of conversations and, uh, uh, and discussions uh, why, for example, we uh, as Eastern European leftists were, at least Razen was a little bit reluctant to officially and formally join the, the, the international European platforms that these radical left uh, parties were offering, let's say, uh, the, 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 the European left uh, organization, which, which kind of is an umbrella organization for very, very many Western European uh, and also, uh, uh, also Czech <laughs> parties. But the problem we, 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 we used to have with those is that um, there were quite a lot of those old school, you know, kind of communist parties which we uh, which were kind of trying to set ourselves apart. Some of the Czech parties as well. <laughs> So we were always very clear at Razen that, okay, we share quite a lot of values, let's say, with the aforementioned uh, Swedish left party. We are very much into the Nordic model of, of economy, it is the original one. Uh, we have quite a lot in common in terms of geopolitics and, and things like that with, with, with the Nordics. But we cannot join your umbrella of organization because, you know, those communists, it's a... Uh, Later on, of course, the thing with the Ukraine, uh, with the Russian aggression and, uh, and, uh, and the war, the, the, the stuff came to, to a head, basically. It came to a head negatively in the sense that we realized, and this is also something that I, I understand we share also with activists from Social Europe, that all these years of dialogue with, for example, German radical left, explaining our position on Russia and Russian imperialism, uh, showing our existence, showing, look, we survive, and they, they have also helped us by, by platforming us in Europe, you know, uh, the foundation money, of course, is, 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 is a factor, even though I would, I would argue maybe not like a huge factor, but we appreciated this, and keeping our dialogue, but it did not help in the end when it came to a head to an existential issue, but what we saw was a, was a fundamental issue fighting, you know, the, this, this, this Russian fascism, as, as, as basically some Russian activists on the left uh, opposition claim, and, you know, uh, uh, violating all sorts of international laws, violating a sovereign uh, country in a region, and so on and so on. We don't want to go into this debate now, because it's a very long debate. But it's very clear where all the organizations sitting here uh, and associated organizations stand in terms of you know, solidarity with Ukraine in this situation. Mm -hmm. And this backing was not really coming back, as you may know, uh, as we're all in the family here, um, uh, coming from the Western left. And uh, this also, positively speaking, has brought us together uh, in Warsaw very, very, very soon, like one week or 10, ten days. Um, this was like a proto proto meeting because uh, uh, Claudia was referring to, to Razen's Congress in, in June in Warsaw. But there was also a proto meeting where we also had our Finnish friends and friends from from Danish uh, in his list and who uh, who uh, in the end signed the statement in support to his solidarity with Ukraine. Um, so so we saw that 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 you know. First of all, what I mean to say is that we have survived, so it, so it means uh, that we know how to survive, we know how to fight with the stereotypes that the liberal uh, establishment in our uh, region is kind of throwing at us ha happily. I mean, as Mina was, was talking about today during lunch, you know, we, we, uh, there are so many stereotypes. And in, in Romania, the word left is, 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 is bad, but in the Czech Republic, the word socialism is bad, and you cannot really uh, you know, platform yourself with, mm. with, with the red, you know, like red is problematic word. However, okay, we, 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 we are kind of skilled professionals, uh, on the one hand, dealing, dealing with this kind of hostile environment, and we have managed to, to succeed and are still here, right? So, so, so this is something, uh, a, a skill set, a communication skill set, 
uh, a survival kind of, you know, this, this sense of community and the education and the kind of sharing, sharing of, of, of common values that, that Lily was talking about. This is something that, for example, the Western left does not have. This is also the reason why they are now stuck in this kind of abstract debates on peace and, you know, like, we want peace, oh, well, all of us want peace, you know, but how, how? So we have to, we have to as, as the central Eastern European left, we have to essentialize, we have to draw the essence of leftism that is like, you know, uh, doing, uh, listening to people, don't talk to me about, you know, what Lenin or Trotsky would say, go and ask Ukrainians what they want, and they want to resist, they want to resist with arms, right? So that's why we back them, because we talk to Social Europe, which is a leftist organization in Ukraine, and we ask them, do you want arms? Is this a problem for you, the arms? Yes, we do, and our members are now in the trenches, you know, fighting. How can we, as we believe that this is a, a, not only a, a, you know, a, a, mention, a, a question of existence, but also a leftist cause, you know, resisting this. So, um, so, so, so these are the things, some of the many things, um, we talked a lot about, you know, like the geopolitical situation in Ukraine is, is big in this, but I'm happy, Claudio, that we spent uh, like two hours now talking about real kind of political and economical and uh, you know, society problems in each of the countries, because this, in the last, let's say, six, eight months, the, 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 the Russian imperialism aspect and, you know, discussing also with the Western left kind of dominated the whole thing. So if we manage to, and I think we will, we have had really, really successful, it's, it's not going to be, it's going to be, if we formalize, form some organizational platform, it's going to be very different from what you see in the West. For different, we, we, we have different strengths, which might seem like weaknesses, but I don't think so, it's, they, are, they are kind of positive. Uh, and, uh, and we hope to, to, to basically, I think our main role will be to shore up, to form this community, to shore up each, other, each other's, you know, kind of uh, initiative and, and, and strengths uh, and help survive, you know, but, but at some point also there are examples, like for example, the, the Razan is a good example where you, um, there is a moment with luck or some momentum where you superate the just surviving and suddenly you shoot forward and you find yourself in some very, very surprising moments where the liberal leader, Donald Tusk, is basically stealing your slogan of housing is the right and not commodity, which we have been promoting for years. Suddenly he goes out and makes the pain of the slogan and is putting it on its head, but it means you're, 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 it's, you're, you're further, you're no longer surviving, you're shaping, you're shaping the, 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 the discourse and everything. And what Machi was, was talking about, the kind of performative politics, you do not always have to react, you can also create the politics. Mm -hmm. So these are all the kind of techniques that we can, we can share, and I think when you look at our friends uh, on the other side of the river, of the Rhine, which is my native, uh, <laughs> I don't know, like, you know, the Western left, they have kind of lost this feeling, right? So they are not really doing very well. But of course, I hope uh, one day we'll come back to talking to each other, but perhaps uh, we will be then on a pr platform of um, uh, first kind of international organization of Central Eastern European Leftists. Post-transformation. Uh, true. Uh, also, because we kind of shape our own political, economic, uh, ideological models, looking at the United States, France, UK, which is Germany, which is, of course, legitimate. We, we, we needed to find a way. Uh, speaking of which, we were talking in the early 90s about the Swedish model. Uh, and yeah, not many things <laughs> were retained or attained uh, in, in this respect. Uh, but in the same time, I think we have a lot of work to do in discovering each other, and mm -hmm. that's 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 the problem. You know, people, countries and people in the semi-periphery, let's say, mm -hmm. they don't really talk to each other because they feel that the centers of power and relevance are somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And they, they're in a constant struggle to approximate, learn, transfer things from those power centers, which is, of course, it's useful, but it's not all. It's not, it's not all uh, what we have. We have uh, very interesting histories, uh, very interesting societies, very interesting struggles, and very interesting and useful lessons. 
to learn from each other. So, uh, because we're uh, running a bit late, I would like to open for one or two questions from uh, uh, from the room, uh, and then uh, yes, we will uh, we will uh, finish shortly. You can have a mic from there. Uh, no, I, uh, yeah. Okay. Hi. Um, let me check the chat because there's someone. Okay, no, they're just complaining. It's the sound is better here because <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's about the sound. And, uh, but I do have a question with a little, I don't know, preamble of how I feel about things. Um, so I, I kind of came to the, the conclusion that in this part of Europe there's a, there's been a lack of social science education in general and maybe that's why we have a lack of civil activity sometimes and sometimes I do find it very hard to organize. Um, and given that the educational, pro in order to implement any policy that serves in a grassroots manner the people, uh, you also have to educate the people to receive that policy because sometimes they get easily distracted by subjects like anti-abortion laws or things that don't really concern everybody <laughs> or so on. And given that the educational process is a long-term process in general and the pragmat more pragmatical kind of uh, actions like uh, Lily was mentioning at the beginning uh, with Orban which is doing things that seem to you know, quite pragmatic and happening, uh, even though they're short-term thinking policies. But uh, somehow, I, I find myself in this kind of dilemma of, you know, proposing things that need a longer process to be uh, internalized by the masses, by people, to actually people to realize how things affect them, in which ways, and so on. Uh, and it's. Uh, yes, this other side of uh, short-term, very pragmatical kind of actions that have been happening all around Europe. And I was just wondering if you guys and girls have any ideas on the, the more, you know, pragmatical aspects that the left parties could actually... Good. Thank you very much. Uh, any other question? Yeah, there is one. Or was actually two. Yeah. I was attracted to this one, Brails by the World. Green in the title, and you didn't talk anything about green. You don't have any spots, or at least a green dot here. What about green parties? Do we have a green party, or at least a green one, or two green parties in Romania? You have a green party in Ukraine, maybe in your countries as well. You didn't talk about greens anything. Why? Good. Uh, it's a very important question. Yes, and there is one in the back. My question is regarding. The it's more or less uh, regarding the situation in Romania, the political situation in Romania, regarding the Social Democrat Party, uh, which in theory is a leftist party, but in practice the power in Romania has always suffered from uh, party switching. So the people that are in PSD right now, which let's say it's, a uh, it's not a majority because it's in coalition, but in the past it was. So people at the top, they always switch their parties because, I don't know, they're just not um, convinced of the, their ideologies. They just want to be in power. How does, let's say, the new left, uh, the left that actually has or uh, wants to implement some ideologies, how can they overthrow these, let's say, long-standing parties that just have red in their flag, but they don't do anything for the people. Very good question. <laughs> I would reserve my uh, right uh, as to step out of my mockery shoes and respond to that. Um, any other question? Yeah. Should we just perhaps otherwise we lose? It will be probably the last one because we don't have much time, so... I would have a long comment, but I will leave it after the, the, the debate was marvelous. But, I am really interested in how we could um, tackle the economic problem uh, by inserting uh, mixed economies in our society. The problem of uh, combining socialist with capitalist mechanisms 
for me is a crucial element for counteracting neoliberalism right now. Have you in your parties tackled this, this issue somehow? Well, okay, let's <laughs> 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 have ten hours <laughs> So basically it's about being pragmatic or thinking long term. How do we build uh, the green dimension into our own activities and common activities? Uh, then the combination of uh, mixed economy and the economic model, and in what sense you're anti-capitalist? Uh, <laughs> um, that's a long one. Uh, and then probably I have to finish with a word on the so-called uh, social democrats in Romania. <laughs> Um, any specific order you want to answer? I don't want to. You can try to answer all the questions in three minutes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, first, and yeah. okay. First, the uh, most education thing is not more or less knowledge. It's about fighting with common sense. For example, in Polish school, we have so-called economy lessons, which are basically hardcore uh, pro-market Chicago Central the Guards lessons. And we'd like to see lessons about labor laws and trade unions and, and cooperatives and still like of it. So it's not more complex, but I think more common sense. Uh, second question uh, about Greece. We're sorry we had we haven't had enough time, but we worked on our principles that we did earlier, and there was a lot about green uh, climate and just transition. So for us, it's just combining uh, the climate uh, policies with uh, egalitarian redistributive policies it's, it, and taxation, tax policies. It's crucial for us, and uh, yeah, but that's uh, that's a thing about uh, old school uh, parties. We've joined one in coalition, and it worked for us so far. So there are no obvious responses, but uh, it occurs that sometimes it's. You have to push them, even if you have no ideas and they're just uh, partiers of power. It's sometimes it's, you can try to push them just to promote your agenda uh, to the left. And I think what we've talked before is we believe that you need to strengthen state uh, economy, uh, trade unions and workers' organization, and cooperatives as far as it's possible. And then you have mixed economy, so it's what you do. If you strengthen state when it's uh, when it's needed and when it works, you strengthen trade unions obviously because it cannot be just uh, top to the bottom, and you strengthen cooperatives and when you get your mixed economy. I answered. <laughs> 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 it was such a uh, quick run. Uh, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna attempt to do something similar. I might take a little bit longer, but I, yeah, I also try and go in order. I think yeah, education is a huge part of it, but it's not only that. In my head, it's more to do with what issue is politicized and what isn't, and what people consider to be the role of politics and what is it that politicians do. Uh, and that takes a long time to change. Like, the housing is like a great example that people don't think of it being a political issue, even though it is. And I think the way you combat it is. Yes, obviously it has to be in the education system, but it's also just community work. It's your presence in these areas where you show like, okay, this is what you think politics is doing in your village or town or whatever, but you need to show an alternative. And it takes a really long time to build. And Sikra, to that point, has quite a few programs now starting out. Uh, for instance, in the 8th and the 9th district where we have our MP, they started doing an energy efficiency renovation program for uh, people living in the district. So an expert will go out and, and like assess the plan and do some small renovations. And that also taps into the green question, because I, I can see your disappointment is uh, very reasonable. But in Hungary, the two green parties also, like they, there was a single green party that split into two, and they are both basically dead in the water, and they are quite liberal. So I also think the way to approach green and ecological issues is to tackle them from this leftist perspective. And a lot of them will be, again, very specific to Central Eastern Europe. Because I don't think there's a merit in trying to take stuff from uh, the Green Party of Austria or Germany that are super liberal, actually. No, you have to start from this socialist grounding and think about what an issue is in our region. It's energy poverty, it's energy efficiency, it's housing renovation, it's the just transition, it's coal mining regions. So I think it's more important to have an answer that's grounded in a leftist framing, and then that's where you bring truly green issues in there, not just like this fake sustainable development bullshit. 
Uh, as to big parties, they are all dead in Hungary, so it's not a problem, I guess, that you compete with them or that they're still around. The socialist parties like non-existent. And the last question, I don't think I'm allowed to answer <laughs> because I'm an ecological economist by training and a deep author, so I think if I say what I think, people will shoot me, so <laughs> that's that. <laughs> Uh, I just want to add about the Green Party. Uh, the Green Party of Ukraine is dead. Uh, it's it's uh, present officially, but uh, it doesn't exist like an activity so, or something. So uh, we stand for it too. We, we, we need to um, include this question in our um, political program in the future or something because yeah, it's, it's really not working for us now, but it's important because the ecological problems uh, after the war and now it's a really critical uh, situation now. Thank you. And very quickly, um, to come back to your question in regards to education, I, I think so, somehow perhaps uh, it's a cross of the leftist that he, he or she or they had somehow think that they have to fix it all, right? Uh, like from a personal perspective now I'm talking, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think everyone who's involved in politics at some point like doubts, if you don't have doubts you're not doing it right, right? Um, but uh, also I, I believe that there's just so much you can do as a person and that's why you have parties and that's why you have communities mm -hmm. because they are there to do the things that you can perhaps not do. Uh, and uh, so in this way, you can organize, I, I believe, in a way to uh, handle and tackle the issues that you can tackle at that specific moment and someone else will be tackling the long term. And that's something always that's working hand in hand, I think, and it's important to keep it going that way uh, for people's mental health. <laughs> because we all have jobs, uh, we all have to uh, pay rent and uh, eat and uh, it gets really difficult and actually in Czech Republic this is just speaking now from my our perspective and uh, once again this, there's already a very low population compared to other countries which means that there's even less people that have the time and place to uh, be activists and, uh, and help and support the cause and so many people help and believe in the cause and support it from afar, but uh, perhaps don't have the means to, to join uh, that meeting once a week or, you know, every two weeks and, and so forth. So I would always just say, like, not to not be so hard of your, on yourself in this regard, because uh, any support in the, in the fight is, is appreciated, I think, and needed. And, and by getting together, I think, that's, and cooperating, that's how we can sort of look at the long uh, plan with, with education and also do this sort of like momentary action which shape each other either way, right? So the, your momentary action is going to have an impact anyway because you're normalizing perhaps an issue. Your um, uh, protest uh, for women's rights normalizes on the long term those rights for women, right? So it's always a ping pong uh, between both. In terms of uh, the, the Greens, I did briefly mention them as uh, the party that <laughs> we sort of slipped away from in 2019. But, uh, you know, for me, it, it, it's important, of course, that we say Green and Left, but for me, the Green is Left, right? And when I talk about leftism, for me, every sort of Green topic is within the bounds already. And uh, Somehow it's been separated on the way, right? Uh, because it started serving purposes uh, that were, you know, used uh, within a capitalist uh, uh, framework and uh, liber uh, liberal politics, and it slipped away from the left. But the, the sort of care for for the, the the environment and all these sort of green related issues have always been. Uh, sort of uh, a, a big topic for the left, uh, and um, so in, in this way, perhaps we should uh, specify it at, at the definition of the left at, at the start. 
Uh, and I completely join you. I think you've said everything that uh, I wanted to say in regards to, to how we have to look at it from a Central Eastern European perspective uh, and understand what being green means for us, right? And not for someone sitting six, seven, eight countries away uh, and looking at some data uh, on a little piece of uh, paper and be like, oh, well, we just have to do all of this now and then things will be better. But, you know, the environment and the people are related, <laughs> interlinked, and we work as one ecosystem. So I think that this is the leftist perspective and approach, which is that we're just ensuring that this ecosystem survives and thrives more than survives, you know, flourishes even. So, yes. Mm -hmm. So I think for, for the green situation in Poland, I think Razem is plain and simply the Green Party of Poland. There is Extinction Rebellion and other uh, inspiring... There is the Green Party of Poland. Poland. Yes, yes, yes. I know, I know. I, know, I, I, know that I will mention that, but the, the, the true, the true Green <laughs> Party. So, so, so our policy on energy transition and just energy transition, you name it, uh, generation, storing, distribution, we have uh, a solution for all, a science-based solution for all of these uh, challenges here. Uh, also, in terms of the just tran transition, for example, Machi is an P from from a mining uh, region, Silesia, this uh, of course has an impact, so we, so we have solution also there. Every single solution that we have in other spheres of life is always turned uh, upside down and looked at every, every side uh, for sustainability aspect. Nothing comes out of, uh, out of uh, the program uh, group that is not sustainable, so it's, it's all integrated, so I, I, I second that. Now, a, a, comment, uh, a comment on, uh, on the education aspect. I, I I may have a, uh, an opinion that slightly differs. I, I think at some point you, you as an individual and also as an organization uh, have to uh, work with a sense of purpose to choose. Are you a single issue uh, activist and a single issue organization? Are you a political actor? Are you more of an NGO? Some people like Sikra can do many things at once, but this is also uh, a, 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 a function of a very, very difficult situation in Hungary where you're kind of forced to do it, lots of things at once, including education, because you're really blocked from even uh, uh, you know, tra transmitting a basic leftist message. So, so I absolutely sympathize with this. But let's say in, uh, in, in a Polish situation, has gone through really these stages. We were, we, and we at every stage we are like a little bit of a butterfly. At every at every stage of, of, of progress, we leave something behind. First, we left a kind of a socialist milieu and big big cities that are still profiting. We we have clubs that are of ex razem members, for example, current but mostly ex razem members that are now kind of you know they they chose their path. They, they were, for example, artists or I don't know. They they, they formed all these clubs and. They are still associated with us. This is very important. This kind of culture to build the culture, build the communities. And then there are quite a lot of um, single issue uh, organizations where, where people basically chose. Okay, they joined us at, at this moment. Uh, Machi was talking about during the, the LGBT supporting protests where our people already we are still and we have a lot of credibility in the communities. And the women trust us and they know that we will, uh, uh, you know, bring back you know the abortion. Uh, um, legalization should we get into power, uh, but lots of them have basically decided to leave the party because they realized, uh, uh, or you know, some single issue like by, by, by nature, people know the political path is not for me, it's, it, it requires a different kind of perhaps uh, thing. So, and now we are a parliamentary party where we have really professionalized uh, uh, in, this, in the kind of a progress of maybe two years. It's the sense of purpose, and of course, the, the, the having a goal in mind. And sometimes it also comes to comes to down to that. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so we got very optimistic towards the end of the, the debate, uh, uh, showing that uh, we are able to not only to survive, mm -hmm. even though it's basic and it's necessary, but also to build, also to innovate. And also uh, support some uh, some victories. I mean, you know, making, uh, for example, in Poland, uh, the representative of the neoliberal centrist pro democracy group talking with your own words and basically saying that you're right. Just uh, to explain what he understand by it, uh, throwing money at uh, banks and developers. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>
on the real thing, mm -hmm. and we have two positions, and it works for us how it should. Neoliberal has it have its own neoliberal position, we have our state-run uh, public housing position, and for us, the democracy works. Quite yes. Um, and this would be probably uh, one of the maybe templates of action, uh, including for Romania, where uh, our own party is quite small, and uh, I mean, we, we do not have the, 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 the power to actually reform the Social Democrats, which is the largest party in Romania. Uh, of course, they are nationalists, they are conservatives, and you know, on these grounds, and also a neoliberal, uh, and on these grounds we can you know, question their, their credentials as Social Democrats. Uh, uh, it's, it's a very long shot to, uh, you know, to wait for them to reform. But at the same time, we have our own responsibility to create the agenda, to uh, build uh, groups, to uh, create a pressure from below. And at some point, it, it is possible, I, I do believe it's possible, that uh, in the right context, parties like uh, Social Democrats or you know, bigger parties in other countries uh, in the region can steal our ideas or start thinking or talking like us and uh, if they also change the decision making in that direction we can safely say that we had an impact even though it was indirect uh, let's look at all the far-right extremist parties which are creating a lot of uh, uh, i don't know uh, kind of movement and uh, you know tension and for this reason uh, this kind of uh, there is a tendency or a uh, uh, you know, uh, there is a, a way, or therefore the, the big parties, which are they do not have internal democratic breaks, it's te it's tempting. So, if the far right in this region and in Europe they create motion, they create agenda, they create movement, they create votes, probably these big parties will go there. So our responsibility is to believe that. Our responsibility is to create that in our own way, with our own values, bringing equality uh, to the forefront, bringing dignity of the people, being solidarity to, to, uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the debate. So this is one way to influence politics, uh, bearing in mind that we're still small, we're still finding our steps, and uh, we come from very difficult uh, environments. But uh, let's be and stay optimistic, and hopefully we will repeat this kind of debate, not only in Romania, but in all the countries which are part of the region and are part of, a part of our initiative, uh, because I, I mean, we feel that there are so many things to, to share, to discuss, and to actually build on for the future. Thank you very much. And we really have to fix the price. <laughs>